Let me break down the three major steps here that you're going to take in order to start coding with artificial intelligence. In this video, we're going to take off every single one of these blocks. It's going to reveal something. We're going to talk about it, and I'm going to give you a timeline of how to approach this topic. As I'm sure you already know, artificial intelligence and its ability to integrate with software is a brand new market, and there is a ton of opportunity in front of us. Therefore, let me walk you through the three major steps you need to take if you want to build out software the correct way. Three major disclaimers before I begin this video so I don't just get sweeped up by the comments. First major disclaimer, this advice is for anyone that is not currently invested by, funded by, or handled by an angel investor, venture capitalist, etc. This advice is for individuals that are either in a small team or themselves and want to approach the concept of AI and software. That out of the way. Second piece of advice here, and as you see from the title itself of like how to actually code with AI or how to start coding with AI if you've never coded before, purpose of this video is I'm gonna start you at the very bottom of if you've never touched code in your entire life all the way to being able to build out full-blown software applications. And the third thing that I already know I'm gonna get some backlash for, so go ahead, leave that comment if you wanna. But no, don't use no-code tools like Bubble to create out your software. This is not smart, this is very bad and not good. Why is that, Corbin? Check out that video right there. I think it's 10, 20 minutes long. I explain everything involved with approaching the concept of building software with no code tools. Does that sound good? Now let's jump in. But Corbin, there was this one person on Bubble that made millions of dollars. I don't care. I don't care. Let me show you the actual way to cut out software. So the steps I'm about to show you and the time I'm about to show you is person to person. What I'm about to show you, you could approach in six months, a year, two years. It really just depends on how fast you learn and how fast you grasp these topics. Step number one here. How do we approach this topic? No code. Wait, Corbin, didn't you just say no code's no good? Watch this. When I say no code, what I'm referencing is you need to get comfortable. I'm not saying jump into code right away. Why am I not saying jump into code right away? Because if you've never coded before or you have little to no experience with coding, that's not smart. Start with something like no code. You first need to understand fundamentally what it is, whether you're using Zapier or Make or Pipedream or whatever the heck else. You need to understand conceptually what it means to pass data around between software. First major advantage of this, you are not going to be completely hit with the wall of a learning curve when it comes to just jumping into code and being like, what's going on? You are gonna be able to leverage these no-code tools and with these no-code tools, build out automations that are going to get you to understand conceptually what it means to pass data from point A to point B. Why is this important? This is important because it's like, if you don't understand what it means to pass data between applications, you're gonna have a hard time approaching more complex topics when it comes to coding. You just don't even know the baseline. For example, app A, let's say it's a chat GBT block within Make or Zapier. Give it a prompt. Oh, it gave me an output for an email. Perfect. App B is gonna be Gmail. Okay, great. We've automatically created an output of an email draft and we sent it to Gmail. Some of y'all might be like, oh no, I get that, Corbin. I get that. I'm gonna skip this part. I just wanna jump right into the coding. Do you though? Understand this to its fullest extent. And what I mean by that is, no, I don't want you to build out a simple four block automation flow. Build out the ones that get to 50. Build out the ones that get up to 80. Build out the automation flows that you have automation A and automation B that communicate with each other. And automation A is 60 blocks and automation B is 40 blocks. And they communicate and give a big output at the end. If any of that didn't make sense to you, that's because you need to fully comprehend automations before the next step here. For example, like right off this image right here, path. Oh, path. Okay, so either do A or B, depending on previous data, previous variables. I'll do path A if this happens or path B if this happens. In code, if else. This kind of stuff is going to be easily learned in a no-code way in the beginning if you have no coding experience, therefore learn it there. So your next statement might be, okay, I understand, but what do I create? What kind of automations do I create? I don't really, I'm kind of lost there. Let me give you two ways to approach this. First major way, if you're currently running a business or plan on running a business, build out automation specifically for that business. That's two birds of one stone. Okay, so you're coming at me and you're like, no, Corbin, I, I don't have a currently a business or I do have a business, but I don't really know how to approach that. If that doesn't apply to you, here's the third way. This way is very much like have fun, do stuff that seems like a cool idea to do. For example, in the very early days when I came to automation and AI, I ran a business before this. It was a physical product-based business. When running that business, we had to make social media captions for a whole month. I created an AI automation that automatically created 30 captions. Why? Because one that applied to number two here, but three that just seemed like a cool idea to do two hours worth of work in 10 seconds through an automation flow. Now, if you want to challenge and you're like, you know, that doesn't really apply to me, Corbin. I think I'm good on the no-code automation platforms. Okay, let me give you a challenge. And when I say challenge, I'm saying this in a way that you could learn a ton of information through building out a flow like this because of the fact that the logic that you'll learn through a flow like an AI article generator could be applied outside of no code and into a software application. So if you want challenge, I'll leave this in the link down below, possibly go to pre-built services, webcafesoftware.com, look at any of these and be like, you know what? 
I'm gonna try that. For example, really complex AI email funnel done through Zapier. This is no joke. This is very much like you send a cold email, the user responds, AI handles the response again, AI handles the response again until a conversion event incurs like a Google Meet, like a conversion on a Stripe landing page. Like this is a straight up AI email funnel. You do the same thing. And this is where you can get towards the more complex workflows in a no-code environment. How long should you be in no-code? You should be in no-code for the extent of which that you feel you could basically do anything within Zapier or Make. Anything. Anything, Corbin. Anything. If you're so comfortable with that platform that someone poses a specific automation or a specific flow and you're like, you know what? I would do this, this, and this. I'll probably drag this block here. You're good to go. And that's what leads to number two here, which is really nice. And this is why these two are kind of paired. Number two. <laughs> Slight code. And the reason I say these are paired is because of the fact is what am, what am I, what do I mean when I say slight code? What are you talking about, Corbin? In a no code application, go ahead and start doing more code oriented type of blocks, e.g. webhooks, e.g. code blocks. This kind of logic will get you comfortable with the actual process of coding itself. Big one here is webhooks by Zapier. Obviously, Make has the same situation here as well. I speak in this in an ubiquitous way. But the idea is that using this, you can get in a very UI-friendly way how to handle webhooks in the context of automations, which then can be translated into software development. Because depending on the type of software you're creating, a lot of times you'll use the ideas of sending API requests to external providers to provide value to your end consumer. Or long story short, start putting webhooks in your automations, start putting code blocks in your automations, or the specific need within the automation. Now, if you want a really good use case of this, you can look at any type of app that currently explores on the Zapier market. And what you can do is simply, for example, Google Sheets. I can go to Google Sheets here, and I can type in Google Sheets API documentation on Google, Google Sheets API overview, and then get yourself comfortable with reading actual documentation. So for example here, we have the ability to read and write cell values. Now, what Zapier does for us, if I scroll all the way down here, is that they'll make this an action within the nice little UI they present here. So they're already handling the heavy lifting when it comes to the code, therefore allowing you to simply put in like, create a spreadsheet row, input data, proceed. The idea is this, for example, create a spreadsheet column. You're gonna find that exact action, but find it within the API documentation. And what I want you to do is replicate it, e.g. the type of action and output that we get with the actual UI block from Zapier do the exact same thing within a custom webhook within the API documentation. This is step two. This is why this is step two. Because then once you can start consulting API documentation and everything above the board in this manner, this is going to open the window drastically. And real quickly, what you'll learn through this process as well is you'll learn very specific information that's not readily available in a no-code platform like Zapier. E.g., when you connect your Google account to Google Sheets, your ability to access that data and that specific account expires every 60 minutes with an access token, but is refreshed through their backend to make it seem that you have an indefinite connection within Google Sheets. If that didn't make that much sense, that's the whole point of why you gotta spend a little bit more time in step two here, leveraging ChatGPT, leveraging Claude, leveraging these AI providers to give you an expedient way to access information on these kind of topics. Therefore, we go from no code to slight code, webhooks, and we hit our final one here, which is code code, or full code. If you feel confident in the no code and slight code realm, then I encourage you to check out this video on the link below. It's three hours and 11 minutes long, and I show you how to actually build out a website from ground zero to ground done with artificial intelligence. I said that weird, artificial intelligence, <laughs> AI, and a web development environment such as a React front end and a back end by Google called Firebase. And your next question might be like, Corbin, why did that take so long? I've always seen these videos like build a website in 20 minutes. Okay, but are those real websites? Do they have a custom domain? They actually show you how to code it with AI or is it like a nice little B roll and they kind of just say, oh, here's your website. But then like half the video was just B roll fancy music. If you're not looking for that and you're looking to actually learn how to do it, check out that three hour and 11 minute course for free. But that leads us to full code. Full code is full on development. Now, the way you approach full code is very simple or simple when you get there. You start at the front end, then you go to the back end. So we're going to do FB, not Facebook. Front-end development on a base level, especially with the way that ChatGPT and these different AI models communicate with us is gonna be easier than back-end development. Obviously, over time and the more experience you have, you're gonna be able to conversate with ChatGPT in a way to get good back-end code. But just as reference, front-end, that's what you're watching right now. That's what like YouTube looks like, whether it's on your phone 
or on your website or a web app. That's the front end, right? It's the UI, user interface. When developing applications, especially software applications with AI, you gotta get comfortable front end. Why is that important? Because if you're gonna launch a software application that's gonna do well, you don't wanna look like it's from 2004. Make it look good, make it look professional, which I show you how to do within that three hour video. The point is that when you go to step three here, first build out a front end. Now you have two options here. Either you can start with a landing page. Let's just get comfortable with the idea of creating a front end that has mobile responsiveness, the ability to connect a custom domain, the ability to connect Google Analytics, the ability to handle live traffic to a website. You can start that route. Or alternatively here, you can just go full in. Just jump into the water and start your idea for your software application, which to be honest with y'all, that's fine. Start with the front end. I think the most fundamental thing to learn if you wanna go that route, build your homepage. What's next? Build a sign up page. Okay, so I have a sign up page. I have a button that says sign up. How do we do sign up? ChatGPT you can talk to, but in reality, Firebase authentication. Obviously there is other ways to do this, but Firebase authentication. Okay, Firebase authentication. Okay, how do I, how do I import Firebase? Like how do I do Firebase? Watch a three hour video. Or alternatively, just talk to ChatGPT. Upload API documentation, start learning this way. Because once you build out a front end, then you build out the authentication process where a user signs up with Google or their email and they get logged into an auth version of your application. That's when the back end comes into play. Whether that is gonna be HTTP callables where you're sending data, receiving no data back, or alternatively sending data and getting data back, or alternatively sending data, having then data stored into their fire storage, et cetera. However it may be, the back end comes into play and there is 100% ways to optimize the back end. But if you're just starting, just do it. What I mean by that is that Let's say your end goal is the user puts in their name and then based off their name, you give them like an email draft. You got version A of how to code this out and you got version B of how to code this out. Version A does it correctly and gets it to the output that you're looking for, but it's not optimized at all. Version B is the best way to do it the most optimized way to do it, the most scalable way to do it. But if you're just starting out, get yourself the version A. <laughs> just prove to yourself you can do it. Because once you prove to yourself you can do version A, everything else becomes easier. Now to be completely blatant and honest with y'all, I started coding when I was 12 to 13 with iOS applications. I did that for four to five years. I ran a physical product based business for two to three years. And then I found myself in the last three to two years doing software oriented companies due to the fact of the pitfalls when it came to retail oriented businesses, physical businesses, et cetera. Now, the reason I say pitfalls and more in the context of an individual or a small team, got to keep prefacing myself because a lot of people get pissed off for no reason. What I'm trying to say to you though, is when I was approaching the opportunity of building out a web application, while my past was more oriented towards mobile applications, I realized very quickly the advantageous return you can get on a web application. What is this return you may ask? Well, first off, when I was developing iOS applications, 35 to 30% of the money I made in that iOS app was taken off the top right away by Apple. That's just how it is, that's how it works, proceed. When you do a web application, no one's taking that. Your biggest transaction cost is obviously gonna be maybe the functions, the AI, but really it's gonna probably be your payment processor for us, Stripe. They take a good amount off the top, but not 30 to 35%. Therefore, from my experience and what I've learned up to this point, it seems like web applications is your most advantageous route as you are the most broad. And on top of that, can recoup the most amount of money for the amount of labor you associate with that application. But I can put it like this, coding in different languages like Swift or C plus and everything about the board in that manner, you speak to it differently, you structure files differently, et cetera, et cetera, but it all has like a same feeling. Therefore, what I can tell you is that when I was building out my first logic when getting outputs using artificial intelligence and getting value points and proceeding for the current software I'm developing, I did A at first. And then a month or two later, it turned into B. And I say this because when you first approach this topic, it's not going to be perfect. You are 100% going to build out a backend that is not optimized at all. But that's not the point. The point is that you did it. And then once you do it, you'll learn more, you understand more, and know how to optimize more. Too much perfection. Don't worry about perfection. Just do it. I shouldn't be saying a Nike slogan with an Adidas hat. We'll let it slide. Those are three steps of how you should start coding if you've never coded before and start leveraging AI. Corbin, I want more applicable steps when it comes to coding with AI. Just check out this channel. Type in Corbin Brown, whatever application you want to use, Cursor AI, VS Code, ChatGPT. I show you everything you need to know when it comes to that. So make sure to subscribe here and I'll see you in the next video. Coding is dead. I don't think anyone's going to code in 10 years. Okay, that's fine. Don't code then. Do whatever you want to do. This is for the people that want to code. Those are two random videos. That's my face. And I'll see you in the next video.